Have you ever wondered what kind of learner your child is in school? Does he fail math, but do well in music? Does he do well in math, but fail social studies? Welcome to the world of Temple Grandin, a highly functioning woman with autism who's known around the world. Some have called her an autistic savant, and you'll see why during our interview today. She recently wrote, Visual Thinking, the hidden gifts of people who think in pictures, patterns, and abstractions. She wrote the book to help adults and parents understand that there are fundamentally three ways that people think, visual, verbal, and mathematical. If you've never heard Temple speak, you are in for a treat. Well, Temple, this is really an honor to have you on. As I said, I've always admired you and admired your work and to get to be able to interview is uh, really a privilege. So thanks for being here. It's great to be here. So I'm going to talk about your brand new book uh, on visual thinking, Hidden Gifts, People Who Think in Pictures, Patterns, and Abstraction. So you're, you're talking about the fact, even in the title, that we're missing talents in kids. And our focus in our podcast is on helping parents help their kids. And so would you begin describing what a verbal thinker is versus a visual thinker? Verbal thinker thinks in words. Now, I think in photorealistic pictures, but I did not know until I was in my late 30s that other people think in words. And being a visual thinker helped me with my animal uh, work because animals are sensory based. And in my book, Visual Thinking, I talk about three kinds of thinking. Object visualizers like me, we're good at mechanics, animals, photography, art, those things go together, terrible at algebra. Mm -hmm. Then you have your visual, spatial, mathematical mind, patterns, math, music. Then you have your word thinker. And then you have people that are combinations of the different kinds of thinkers. Lots of people are mixtures, but you get a kid that has a label, autism, dyslexia, ADHD, or whatever, learning problems, they tend to be one of the extremes, an extreme object visualizer, an extreme mathematician, or maybe extremely verbal. Do you think we're misdiagnosing kids? Well, I'm talking about how they think, because when mm -hmm. it comes to autism, you can have autistic object visualizers like me. You can have computer programmers that are autistic. They're the mathematicians. And then you can get, you know, autistics that are verbal, that love history. They love facts about their favorite thing, like sports teams or movies. Mm -hmm. So let us into the mind like yours of a visual thinker. My understanding is just from reading about how your mind works is that if I gave you a word, you would see that word in a picture. And then that picture would go to another picture and another picture. Is that correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like uh, in the HBO movie, the word shoe was said, and a whole bunch of different shoes came up. Okay, in the old days, 35 millimeter slides, today, PowerPoint slides. Mm -hmm. But the same thing. It's also associative thinking, and I can get off the subject. Okay, I could get into horseshoes. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I could get into horses. One reason I thought of horseshoes is just got an invitation from a farrier organization mm -hmm. email that I was trying to answer right before we started. So that's why that triggered the horseshoes. So then you would go from horseshoes to what? A saddle? Uh, no, or riding, or riding horses. Um, I can now remember uh, holding the horses when I was in high school when the farrier came to shoe them. Mm -hmm. We had this one horse, Goldie, and she was a perfect lady for things like shoeing but she'd been abused and she was just about unrideable. Oh. People on her back were bad. People mm -hmm. on the ground were good. So you will start at one spot in your thinking and you'll end up at a different spot. Well, that's right. Now I can control it. When I do design work, what I used to do, I remember one time I was sitting in a project meeting we were discussing all these conveyors and I'm going, oh, that's not gonna work. No, if you do this, you'll pull it out of the ceiling. I, could, I can control it and I could test run different designs. When you talk about seeing engines work or motors work and how you can visualize the screws and the movement or you know whatever it is to, to 
no, I can see visual things, you can just see how it works. The thing that's weird is art and mechanics tend to go together. And the person who's the best mechanic who can fix anything is the guy that can't do algebra. I worked with people in the meat industry that barely graduated from high school that might have 20 patents each, owned a metal fabrication shop, and were inventing mechanical complicated equipment. And then the degreed engineers we need those for boilers and refrigeration. Right. What I don't understand when you're talking, just backing up, when you're talking about, you've described how, you know, there are mistakes made and, you know, buildings blown up or whatever, because there was a problem with the way an engine functioned or something mechanical functioned. Well, you see, they didn't see the risk. They didn't see, like take Fukushima. In my book, Visual yes. Thinking, I talk about Fukushima. Yeah. And they did a perfect job of calculating all the shaking to make that reactor earthquake proof. Perfect job. But they didn't see the water flooding the site and drowning the electric emergency cooling pump. And I'm going, how could you do this? And what yeah. I used when I was young, I used to call it stupidity. I don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. they, they don't see it. Mathematicians calculate. Because they, they looked at their numbers rather than seeing... They look at their numbers. They mm -hmm. just look at their numbers. And I was just talking to our farm manager yesterday about breeding cattle. And they're just looking at, okay, the meat production and stuff like that. And we're getting heart problems now in, in cattle. Mm -hmm. We had better start looking at that. And we, then, uh, then the farm manager was showing me pictures on her phone of like bad legs on cattle. And yeah, you can't just look at the numbers. So will you be able to look at that horse with bad legs and having a heart issue and see the blood flowing in the heart and figure out what could be the problem? Well, I can, I can see it. And I'm also seeing when I was a child, we had this thing called the visible man and the visible woman. Mm -hmm. And it was a plastic model. That yeah. we, and then you know, we painted all the veins on it and stuff like that. I'm actually seeing that right now. Then I'm seeing some, some prepared anatomy specimens. Mm -hmm. But I can see it. I'm also seeing some really ugly pictures of congestive heart failure in cattle. Yeah. And there's a very, very big genetic component. Okay. So do you feel you'll be able to kind of get a handle on that and help them solve that problem? Well, uh, so you need people like me to prevent some of these problems. Okay. If they had put watertight doors on Fukushima, it would not have happened. Mm -hmm. Watertight doors, simple, old-fashioned watertight doors to protect the electric pump that you really need. Mm -hmm. Well, so I think some people would wrongly say, well, those guys were sort of too smart for their own good. They could see certain things, but well, they couldn't I, see the basic. What I'm saying is that they don't see it. Mm -hmm. And then the Boeing Max issue started out as a visual thinking mistake. Do you think in our current educational system, because you talk about you know kids and language development and then at certain ages, are we training all of our kids to be word thinkers? And even like to the point where you may have an eight or 10 year old who is naturally a visual thinker, but if we're talking to them in verbal instruction and verbal thinking, are we, are we sort of dampening that gift that a child has? Well, what's happening with the visual thinkers like me, we can't do algebra. I don't think I could graduate today from high school in California because of the math requirements. And when I did a book signing mm -hmm. for visual thinking, I went to a school, they had it in a school, and I talked to a principal out there, didn't even know what my kind of thinking was. Wow. And the problem is these math requirements are screening these kids out. We need them to fix stuff. Right. Invent mechanical things. There's equipment we don't make, like poultry mm -hmm. processing equipment. And it comes mm -hmm. from Holland. We don't make much of any, anything. And you have a whole chapter in your book called Screened Out, where we're basically screening right. out all the visual thinkers and they're not going into the trades. They're not, you know, like the plumbing and the people who can see things operating. How did we get to that point? Well, we took out the shop classes. We took out the hands-on classes. That was the first big mistake. And some states and some school boards are now putting it back in. You know, when I was in elementary school, I took sewing and woodworking and art. I just loved those classes. I, I would have hated school without those classes. And you see then 25 years later, that's mm -hmm. catching up with us as the mechanical people are retiring. Check out elevator mechanics and 
escalator mm -hmm. mechanics. Mm -hmm. They're all old. The other big mistake that a lot of companies made is taking out in-house mm. engineering. That was another big mistake because they could farm the work out to a local shop. But then when all the local shops retire, who have you got to fix your factory? Do you think a lot of the visual thinkers, like kids who are good at fixing things, and they don't do well in algebra, and they don't do well in the traditional classes at school, do you think, do they end up sort of feeling dumb at school? They're getting shunted into special ed. They're getting addicted to video games, and they're going nowhere. And they're not getting great jobs in the video game industry. I would have a much nicer opinion of it if they got fabulous jobs. And they're not. And mm -hmm. and they're growing up, they never used a tool. I had a kid in my uh, college student in my class a year ago that had never used a ruler in her life. Um, how can a teacher or a parent identify a child who's a visual thinker? You talk about, you wrote a survey, it's not a survey, but it's a questionnaire, which is really... Well, yeah, that was a question. That was a questionnaire. It wasn't my questionnaire. We just duplicated it, but I thought it was good. But how can you tell, like, maybe when seven and eight-year-olds, what kind of thinker they are? Well, the visual thinkers gravitate towards art mm -hmm. and mechanical things and Legos. Then your math kids, they'll often gravitate towards music, math. And a lot of those kids are getting mm -hmm. bored doing stupid little boring math when they need to be moved way ahead. They also like Legos. And the word thinkers usually are not interested in the Legos. But I'm seeing too many kids mm -hmm. where they don't graduate beyond the Legos, where the kid's now a teenager and tools were never introduced. That's ridiculous. Right. So what happens in the current educational system to the kid who likes Legos, they like building things, they like building robots, what happens to them? How, how do we, how do we dampen that? It's just we don't give them opportunities to do what they're meant to do. Well, they don't have the opportunities, opportunities to show off their mm -hmm. skills. Because I worked with people that had twenty patents each, that took a single welding class in high school. Wow. Or they grew up working on cars. I mean, this is where there's a whole things with industry. I was out there working on big construction projects and seeing how the labor's div divvied up. Now you want a pork processing plant, you're gonna import all the equipment mm -hmm. from Holland. Now, 20 years ago, that wasn't right. true. So I'm the kind of person that, yeah, I, I'm reading your book, I realize I'm a much more visual thinker. If somebody tells me directions on how to get from point A to point B and says, go down this street, turn down this street, turn down this street, I can't get there. But if I draw a map of it in my head, I get there. Is that object? I like to, when I got to go somewhere new, I don't really like GPS very much because it tells, it doesn't give me enough right. warning. I uh, actually, I had kind of a scary trip to the Dallas airport recently where the GPS was so slow in telling you that it actually got kind of dangerous. Oh, okay. um, I would rather look at the, at all the Google maps and then make myself a little map with the turns so I kind of know where I'm going to go before right. I go. Do you draw pictures of maps in your head? Yeah, I can do, um, especially places I know, okay, the route to the airport. Yes, I can make a map of that in my head because that's a route I've been on a few hundred times. So even if, if you've been on it, just because you talk about people who have just seen something once or twice and they can recall it in a picture in their mind. It's sort of it's sort of like I don't remember every hotel room I stay in because I could care less about hotel rooms unless they're either really weird or really awful. Then I might remember mm -hmm. them. But if someone says this is the top secret such and such machine, yep. Now <laughs> snapshot. <laughs> that will yeah. Be remember. Yeah. So is being able to see a machine functioning, is that just a gift you were given? Because there are a lot of people who are visual learners and thinkers who couldn't do that. They could see the machine, they could see some nuts and bolts, but they couldn't see it functioning. How, how did you get to the place where you can actually see it functioning so you would know how to fix it or where the problem is? Well, you just see how it works. And people that are good visual thinkers can take something apart and just see how it works. And, you know, and the thing that's really strange, it seems like that mechanical ability and art ability 
tend to go together. Mechanic, okay, uh huh. And art ability and mechanics go together, and music and math go together. Okay, the complementing. Um, I just wanted to read a couple of just for our audience of the um, the questions in the identifier that you that you've written about. Do you think mainly in pictures instead of words? Um, do you know things without being able to explain how or why? Isn't that kind of what a savant does or or is that something that's well a savant has a savant has a very specific memory for certain things like they'll like calendar savant i am not a calendar savant. Mm -hmm. that's definitely not me and that's extreme memory okay and things that i like okay well, i remember when i first went to big meat packing plant in arizona i remember looking out onto that and going it's so complicated how does a plant manager understand this whole big factory? So then I started going over there, my own self-made internship on Tuesday afternoons. And after about six months of Tuesday afternoons, I had videotaped that entire factory into my head. Mm. And I could start at one end and walk. But that didn't happen instantly. Okay. I started out picking out some little details. I remember one of the first things was a little hoop thing for moving a 55-gallon mm. barrel. It's very clever. Mm. That was sort of like the first thing I videotaped okay. in my mind. In your mind, okay. It was a little cart moving a 55-gallon barrel that was very mm -hmm. clever, that had a hoop on it. I need to take a quick break, but stay with me. There's a lot more that Temple has to say, and you don't want to miss it. Welcome back. Before we go back into our interview, here are a couple of facts about Temple. A movie was made about her life and Claire Danes starred in it. Temple didn't speak until she was almost four years old and many doctors and educators wrote her off, but her mother refused. She made sure that Temple had speech therapy and that she was pushed in her education. Talk about cows. There's a question that you have in this, and I, I just find this interesting. I'll explain the association I have in my head, and maybe it's just a weird association, but it's mine. Um, number 13, can you feel what others are feeling? Now, what does that have to do with visual thinking, and how does that relate to the work that you have with cows? Well, what, let's just back up. How does that relate to being a visual spatial learner? Can you feel what others are feeling? Well, I obviously I can tell if somebody's happy or mm -hmm. mad, but I, I I have to learn social stuff almost like being in a foreign mm -hmm. country. You know, this is how you behave. And being a visual thinker helped me with cattle because the first thing I looked at is what mm -hmm. are they seeing? They'd be going up a chute to get vaccinated and they just would stop and there was a shadow going across mm -hmm. it. And that was obvious to me but to somebody else, it was not mm -hmm. obvious until I pointed it out. And then they go, oh, duh, mm -hmm. I see that. So is that because you're more in tune with what a cow is seeing or because you can see things others can't see? Because because you talk. Because I, I see things. I'm finding like uh, on training people to look at the things that bother cattle. I remember I went out to big plant this spring. There was a gate handle mm -hmm. that jiggled like this. That made the cattle stop. And I said, you see that gate handle jiggling? And they, when I pointed out, they mm -hmm. see it. But we're standing right there. And we'd already talked about, you know, some of the stuff that scares cattle. And they don't see it until we point, I, until I pointed it out. Now, here's a great big shadow right here that appeared in the middle of a cattle handling facility. I call that the spider mm -hmm. monster. And that appeared at 3.30 in the afternoon. And the cattle wouldn't walk over that. This was on a project this mm -hmm. spring. And it wasn't there in the morning. Everything was working fine. It's a shadow from the overhead structure. And then in the afternoon, I go, oh, no. Oh, no wonder they won't move. Right. Yeah, when I point it out, they mm -hmm. see it. But they're out there having a horrible time with the cattle, and they didn't realize what was wrong. And I've been talking about this for years. I have to train people to see it. I have to give them checklists. Is that because of, do you think, because of the way you think, or is it because you're Yes, I think it's the okay. way I think. How can we or can we translate that as parents into seeing what their kids experience and see that we may not see? Because it's almost like you were able to get behind the eyes of a cow 
and sort of walk? Well, because I'm, I think, I think visually, I said the first thing, and I talked to a lot of big corporations, and I said the first step is you've got to realize that different kinds of thinking mm-hmm. exist. That's the first thing you've got to do. Verbal thinkers tend to get a lot of abstractions where my mind goes for some specific solution to mm-hmm. a problem. The first thing you have to realize is that now when a kid's three years old, you're not usually not going to be able to tell right. them. But they get around seven or eight. My kind of mind gravitates towards art, mechanics, and building things. The math kids will gravitate towards math and don't bore them doing baby math because they'll turn into behavior mm-hmm. problems. And the verbal thinkers are uh, more verbal stuff. And then there's, and kids tend to be more visual than okay. adults. There's actually been some research on that. But the first thing is realize that thinking exists. Right. Right. And then, and then a lot of people are mixtures. But when you get the kids to get a label, any kind of a label, this is where you tend to get into the extremes an extreme visualizer, an extreme mathematician, an extreme word thinker who knows every baseball player's mm-hmm. statistics. Um, so we have, you know, visual thinkers and people of all different, with all different IQs. And we know that people on the autism spectrum tend to have much higher IQs. Is that correct? Or is that an overgeneralization? Well, yeah, if they're verb, fully verbal, um, and then the problem we got with autism, you're going from Einstein, no speech until mm-hmm. age three, he'd land in an autism program today to somebody who can't trust themselves. And it's all got the same name. Well, you said you didn't you didn't talk until you were four. Is that right? That's right. Didn't talk until four. By eight years old, I did not know how to mm-hmm. read. My mother and my teachers were very concerned about that. And mother started teaching me with phonics, just sounding out my words, reading a book worth reading out. Get a book that's interesting. We used The Wizard mm-hmm. of Oz. And then she'd read, we did it all out loud. She'd read a page, stop in the real interesting part, and then have me sound out a few words. Did it help you for people to read to you or for you to read yourself? Mother did a lot of reading to us. And so I got interested in books. My favorite book in fourth grade was a book about famous inventors. (laughs) And by the way, I've got a book for kids called Calling All Minds. Yeah. Got all my little aviation projects in there. And we've got too many kids today that have never made a paper snowflake. They've never made a paper airplane. They're totally removed from right, real things. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Um, in neuroatypical thinking, there are often things that you have, you know, socially distant, no eye contact, sensitivity to certain feelings disorganization. I have a friend who's brilliant, but can never remember a thing. And it's very, very frustrating. This apparently is all brain wiring, correct? Well, I think especially in the extreme versions mm-hmm. of it, you see, and when you get kids with learning difference labels, you get, you're more likely to get the extreme versions. I think there's a lot of people that are middle of the road kind of mixtures mm-hmm. and, and that's less evident. Yeah. If you have somebody who feels socially awkward or is forgetful or disorganized, I love how you talk about, you know, messiness, but to you, it isn't a mess. You know where everything is. Um, Can you train those people? For instance, a person who's very, very forgetful, but they're very, very smart. They're on the autism spectrum. Can you get them to remember? Can you change brain wiring or is that just the way they're always going well, let's, uh, I think what I find uh, helps is I uh, I have a calendar where I can see the whole month. Okay. Then when I'm like buying plane tickets, for example, I know, okay, fly east. I got a two-hour time zone difference going against me. It's going to take a whole day to fly to the east coast. So if I have a talk on the east coast, I got to have a travel day before mm-hmm. it. You see it on a calendar where I can see the whole month, I can okay. see that. I hate sequential calendars. I just hate them. All right. So you can you can improve. I don't want to call it memory, but that. Well, I, if, if the other thing I can't do is remember long verbal strings right. of instructions. Don't make me try to remember that. Give me a pilot's checklist. Step one, step two, step three, step four, and I can write down some bullet okay. points. But it has to be written down. It can't be just in your mind. I, I need the checklist. And then the, that's a real simple accommodation. Mm-hmm. 
and if a school thinks it's stupid, you can say, well, the FFA makes the pilots do it. <laughs> they don't think that's stupid. it. That's something Temple Grandin would say. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But I'm thinking about the reason I'm asking is because there are a lot of neuroatypical kids who have things like, you know, you said they could walk in a room and see one thing out of place and they feel like the whole room has changed or how you were seeing United Airlines marquee or something and there were 10 of them and you saw the... Oh yeah, that was our electrics. They had a whole bunch of flat screen TVs with the name of the airline on it. Like there was maybe 30 TVs in a row said United Airlines on them and one TV was Mm -hmm. corrupted. And I noticed that the minute I walked in there and the person I was with didn't see it. I said, did you see if that sign was messed up? Yeah. I go, yeah. no. I saw it the instant I walked in that one of the TVs had scrambled the lettering. Did you get stuck on that? Did it bother you? Did you feel like you needed to fix it? No, I didn't get stuck on it. I just noticed it. Okay. Because some people can get stuck on things, can't they? And they ruminate over and over and over unless... I noticed it. You see, and that's the same... Same thing that cattle notice is a paper cup on the floor and they won't want to walk right. over it. Right. But I imagine there are people that do get stuck on it and it prevents them from going about the rest of their day, I would think. Well, yeah, there's probably, probably some that do. One of the big problems I'm seeing with a lot of fully verbal autistic teenagers, they're not getting out learning basic life skills like shopping. Mm-hmm. I'm seeing too many parents overprotect their kid. And they're not doing any basic stuff, bank account, shopping, laundry, um, learn, ordering food by, by themselves in a restaurant. Just basic stuff like this. I am seeing this over and over and over again. We're really handicapping our kids. Where does this come from? It is. Where do you think this has come from? Because you've seen a lot. I mean, you, you've been around for a while. Well, the kid has an autism diagnosis. I see this in meeting after meeting. The mom will do all the talking yeah. for the kid, you know, and, and I said, no, I want the kid, your kid to ask mm-hmm. the question. And then I really get happy when I get them to take the mic and they'll ask the question in front of everybody. And I said, I want to, I want to uh, commend this kid for talking to right. everybody. That was a big step for them. But there's a tendency for the parent to do too much mm-hmm. for the kid. And then when I suggest something like go and buy something in a store, I've had moms say, well, I can't let go. Yeah. Yeah. Or if I suggest when you're pumping gas, have the kid take a $5 bill into the convenience store and buy Mm -hmm. something in there. And I've had a mom say that she doesn't know if she can get the guts to do that. Well, this is a parenting, this is a parenting podcast. So I hope all the parents are listening. This is a parenting podcast. And that's one of the reasons why I'm bringing this up because these kids are going nowhere and I'm running into this pattern over and over and over again with autistic kids, fully verbal, 10 years old and up, that have never gone shopping right. by themselves. Or, or even learning a regular household chores, starting a dishwasher, washing dishes. Well, that's uh, right. Yeah. Well, that's right. They need to be learning all that stuff when they're a whole lot younger. I wonder if parents feel, my child is limited because they're autistic. They don't like close it. I think that's part of the problem. I've got another book by, that I did with Deborah Moore called Navigating Autism. And Deborah Moore came up with this term called label locking. Mm. And I think it's a good example of label locking. And I think the kid's helpless. And I, I think in specific examples, another time we're out at one of the airports, and I, was, I was sitting in the gate and this mom comes up with a 12 year old girl. They wanted to get a picture. And I asked her if she'd ever shopped and I handed her a $5 bill and I said, go in that shop across the hall and buy mm. something. And she went in there and bought a drink and brought it back. That was the first time she'd ever shopped by herself. But it was a store that was right across the hall. We could see it. We could sit in the gate. And- I wonder, what was the mother afraid of? Well, I, that, I didn't send them to the other right, end of the terminal. Right, right. It was across right. the hall. So I, so I wonder why parents are doing this to their kids. Well, I don't know, but they, I had one mom admit that she couldn't mm-hmm. let go when I suggested that her kid buy some printer right. paper. And she actually started to cry and said she couldn't let go. And I said, about printer paper? Yeah. Really? This, I mean, this is really more of an emotional issue than anything. Well, I think I think it may be, but the kid is going right. nowhere. And then what makes me crazy, when I go out in the industrial world, you got autistic people owning metal fabrication shops and patenting, tons mm-hmm. of patents. This is what makes me want to pull out my hair as I go back and forth between the worlds. Right. 
Right. So how do we how do we connect those? How do we moving forward? Let's say a 10 year old autistic kid lands in your home and Temple Grandin has that rate to raise that kid until they're 20. And that kid can't remember things. They um, well, you know, I, I, OK, that's a different issue. Not okay. remembering things. OK, we got to look at what the issue is, because the people I was talking to, they were perfectly capable of going in the store and buying something. I was buying stuff at seven or eight. Now, if there's some kind of memory problem, okay, that's some other mm-hmm. issue. You see, you see, what happens is, is that verbal thinkers overgeneralize about autism. Um, I think stuff with the shopping is the mom not wanting mm-hmm. to let go. And mother, my mother had a really good sense of what I could do in gradual getting me always doing okay. new things. If a kid can't remember anything, then that's a, a separate okay. issue. And maybe the mother runs around and does things for that person because they can't. He does things for them. And I see with nonverbal kids that are perfectly capable of feeding themselves, getting still fed Mm -hmm. when they should learn to eat themselves. You know, I wonder from a mother's perspective, if mothers can't tell which character qualities, which characteristics can be changed and which can't. Um, you know, for instance, you can teach a kid to shop and, and I don't know whether you can teach a child who has, um, tactile sensitivity and won't wear certain, can you train that out of them? If mom says, no, you have. Well, actually on some of the sensory sensitivities, one of the things that can help on sound sensitivity is let the child control the dreaded sound thing, like the vacuum cleaner, let them turn that on and off. Uh, and now with headphones, if you wear them all the time, it makes sound sensitivity worse. Mm-hmm. So what you want to try to do is have them with you. You have control. Have them okay. with you. Then try not to wear them. Where you get control, that can sometimes help on some of the desensitization. But there's no way you're putting wool pants on me and be on a long flight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's not something, an itch for the whole right. entire So you're going to always have it, but you've learned how to live with it and control it. Yeah, and and I still don't like you know loud mm-hmm. noise, but I've heard of kids that wore headphones to the point where quiet dinner conversation at home became yeah. overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And things like I've talked to one parent where their kid was terrified of the vacuum cleaner, they let him turn it on and off and play with it, and it became his favorite thing. Oh, okay. Because he controlled right. it. That's right. the key. Yeah. That's pretty remarkable. Well, I think this has just been incredibly informative to parents and teachers. So if you could tell parents two things to do that would help their kid who's a visual learner and tell teachers two things that have to happen to help kids succeed more, what would those things be for parents? Well, there are a lot of things. I always get asked all the time, what would I do if I could do something to fix the schools? I'd put all the hands-on classes back in we had in the mm-hmm. 50s. Music, sewing, cooking, woodworking, art. You know, then in high school, mechanics and welding and all those mm-hmm. kind of things. Theater, I want to make sure we have that too. All of these things can expose kids to career mm-hmm. possibilities. Mm-hmm. I'd put all those things back in because that's where kids can then try a lot of stuff and they'll find yeah. out what they're good at. They'll find out what they hate. I, I tried musical instruments. I couldn't figure out how to play a little flute yeah. that I had. Yeah. But at least I got exposed to it. Another kid's going to pick up that flute and take off with it. Yeah. And the damaging part is that if we don't let kids do that, they get, you know, channeled into one area where they're terrible and then they feel stupid the whole the whole rest of their lives. Well, and I just feel strongly about kids not being labeled certain things because often they're mislabeled. Like I said, it's having a learning issue when they don't have a learning issue. They just learn very differently and they think very differently than other people. And that cripples kids. And then you've got a mom who says, oh my gosh, you know, my child is limited. So what can I do with their limitations or even ADHD? As you were describing, you know, earlier in our conversation, sort of jumping from the the horseshoe to the riding to this, you know, your mind was going in a different direction a lot. And a lot of people would say, well, that's because you have ADHD and you're jumping around. No, that's just, you don't. That's just sort of where a visual thinker goes. And, and what you do. Well, if you, if you saw the HBO movie, it showed the dipping vat projects I did. And one of the things that motivated me to do those projects 
is I wanted to prove to people I was not stupid. And when I showed people my drawings and when people, that's how I sold jobs. I showed off my drawings. Wow. So people really thought you, people really thought you were stupid? Well, what started to show people I wasn't stupid is when I started writing for our state farm mm -hmm. magazine. And there's a scene in the movie where I go up and I get the editor's card. I saw that door. And I got a reputation that when I covered a producer meeting, I summarized the talks mm -hmm. accurately. And I got respect yeah. for that. And then when I started designing things and people started seeing yeah. my drawings and the way I sold Cargill, I designed the front end of every Cargill beef plant in North America. Well, how did I get that job? I sent a drawing very similar to this. The head at Cargill, along with a bunch of wow. pictures. And they went, wow. Yeah, because I have a hard time looking at those. That's yeah. right. That's what well, I and what I appreciate in your book, um, Visual Thinking, is that you do have some of those drawings. And really, for a person who is a visual thinker, too, I get what you're talking about because it's just, it's really profound. We're running out of time. You have been very gracious with your time. I could talk to you for another hour. Like I said, I've always admired you. I've always wanted to talk with you. And when I saw you in an airport, I said, I can't go up to her, but I just ran up and said hello. And well, good. I'm glad you did. I'm so grateful, too. And uh, yeah, I think actually we're getting on the same airplane but that's a whole nother story how you fly and listen to things and um, so sensitive to to hearing things on airplanes so well thank you so much have a good day thank you for having me now on to my points to ponder one if your child is struggling in school dig deep to find the problem Kids are too quickly labeled as learning disabled, intellectually challenged when they aren't. They may simply think differently than other kids in their class. So help find out your child's learning process. Talk with educators and professional education specialists until you find an answer. Two, learn to understand autism. We're learning more about children who fall on the autism spectrum. If you're concerned that your child does, Take them to an autism center or to your doctor and discuss your concerns. When you go, come with a list of things that you're worried about. For instance, difficulty relating to friends, sensory issues, hypersensitivity to sound, and more. Getting help early is critical to the health and success of a child with autism. Three, learn about your child's thought process. Study your child. Does he do better with chores when you write them down? Or does he do better with chores when you tell him to do them? Is he musically inclined, but bad at math? If you study your child, you'll see patterns begin to emerge. I wanna thank my extraordinary guest, Temple Grandin, for allowing me to interview her today. She is a very busy woman and I'm humbled to have her on. I strongly suggest that you read any of her books, but read Visual Thinking first. To find out more about Temple Grandin or learn about her movie, go to templegrandin.com. Now let's review my points to ponder. One, if your child is struggling in school, dig deep to find an answer. Two, learn to understand autism. And three, learn about your child's thought process. Well, thank you for trusting me with all of my interviews, particularly today. Your listening matters to me. And always remember that great kids are raised, not born.